So my name is Guy Odisha. I'm here every other month on the second Sunday of the month. And, uh, and I often uh, will do a talk, kind of a Dharma talk, based in the Yoga Sutras. And, uh, and today's will be along those lines, although a little bit different. Um, uh, we'll touch on some of the Yoga Sutras lightly, but into some of the other uh, dharma from the yoga tradition, into some of the Buddhist dharma, and also kind of, uh, this is perhaps a new trend for me, kind of touching into a little bit of what's happening in our lives, in our world, in our culture uh, today, and, and uh, at least attempting to make a connection of how our, how is the wisdom of the great traditions relevant to what is unfolding around us today and how can we bring that wisdom uh, into our lives today in a way that, that um, doesn't seem like an anachronism, it doesn't seem like ancient wisdom, but seems perfectly fitted for what is happening today. Yeah. Yep, thank you, Gary. I was going to say, I have a feeling we're going to be competing with um, uh, traffic and airplanes this morning because, for that very reason. So um, one option, um, m move forward. And also, if at some point it's just, um, if, you're, if you're just not able to hear me, let me know, and we can turn the volume back up a little bit. I, uh, I, I don't like to hear myself when I'm talking. Um, so I always have them keep it a little bit low, but we can change that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted that you feel that way. I, I'm not quite there with you yet. I'm working on it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you for coming this morning. It's a, it's a, a glorious morning and all kinds of reasons. I mean, there are always all kinds of reasons. Uh, not to come, but today there seem to be you know, many more uh, you know, here in Minnesota to have a lovely summer day to be outside playing. Um, it's very seductive. So that you made this choice, um, I just want to honor that. Right? In, the, in the midst of all other choices and reasons, you made this choice. And, uh, and, and the inside of that choice is kind of what I want to talk about today. Right? This, uh, of all of the choices that we have to make uh, throughout our day, moment to moment, and in particular, uh, you know, relative to you know, our spiritual practice, relative to our development as people, the unfolding of our soul, so speaking about those decisions more so than, um, you know, what's for supper or what to watch on Netflix, it's a, when you're making a decision around your own uh, actualization of your true self. And, uh, so this, this the, the, at the core of that right, is this this term that I want to use today that I, I think sometimes can be, I don't know, a little provocative. Um, I think people can have a, a bit of a prickly uh, reaction to it, right? So it's moral responsibility. Right? And there can, there, there's quite a bit of contention that can be found in both of those words, right? Moral, what is that? Right? And responsibility. Who wants that? Uh, so, so putting the two together can create quite a bit of internal energy in, in the sense of resistance or just confusion. Right. And for example, with morals, um, often we might think of that on the surface at least in the sense of a moral code, maybe Ten Commandments, right? so a set of, of rules that have been laid down to govern our conduct and how we are supposed to be. And then 
some sense of I'm being moral if I follow the rules. Right? But it's unfortunately not that easy. Right? Is there, the, rarely do li does life situation break itself out into the easy application of a rule. And in the situations where it does, that's actually not a problem. Right? If life is presenting us with an either or choice, and we have a clear sense of, well, this, this is what is right here, even if it's through the application of a rule, well, we don't have to worry about those moments because those are easy. It's the moments when it's not so clear that, we, that either we can apply a rule and we, the application of the rule may or may not lead to the outcome that is desired. It may not lead to an optimal outcome. Right? We might feel like I've done the right thing. Right? I applied the rule. I'm off the hook. But, but what morals represent, and this idea of responsibility, the two together, what that represents is that that, that is absolutely not the case. Right? That, that what is is demanded of us is a great deal more than that. Right. That, that in that sense of responsibility is the consequences of our choice matter. They weigh on us. They have impact. Right. And we want to be in relationship to that. Right. So on a, on a simple way, you could say um, around kind of this idea of moral responsibility, when we abdicate that, right, when life is offering us an opportunity to make a choice, to act, right, to enact this, this uh, moral responsibility, and we don't do it, right, that we can get away with not acting, or we feel like we can get away with not acting. Right? One of, there's many, but one of the impacts of that is, is that it weakens us. Right? It disempowers the self. Right? Inaction weakens us. And, and in that I'm me, right? that my responsibility to myself is to manifest myself, right? to come to realize and embody the fullness of myself. So in taking that action of doing nothing and disempowering and weakening myself, Right there, I have broken with this kind of prime directive. I've, I've shirked my responsibility, and the consequence is to become less myself. And if we, you know, if we think of one time, not a big deal, but again, throughout the day, and the days and the weeks and the months and the years, we make thousands of these choices. And if we're continually making the choice that weakens us, then, then that's what we get. Right? Is, a, is a weakened, disempowered self. Again, the opposite of what the great traditions ask of us. Right? Like the central demand of the great traditions is self-realization, regardless of which we look at. But whatever tradition we look at, in, in, the, in the heart of the teaching, right? the scriptures, is, is this demand to self-actualize. Right. So it is, that is the place where I get this, draw on a sense of responsibility. Right. Like, at the very core of, of what it means to be a conscious being is this sense of a responsibility right. to self-actualize, to become the, the best and brightest you. And then we come into this area of, of morals. We have that imperative, and we need to act. Right? We need to make decisions. We need to make choices. We need to manifest ourselves in the world. So as I was kind of found myself contemplating this, um, this area, and I came to it in some great part by just sitting with with what feels like is unfolding in the culture around me. And 
without you know, becoming too large or too grand about it, we could probably also say you know, it goes beyond our country and our culture to a, a large part of the world in this particular moment uh, where there is this, a polarization that is happening. Right? So if we speak about it just here, right, just somewhat locally, feeling this polarization that is happening in our society. And one of the ways that I notice this is the few times now, the few times that I turn on the TV and listen to what is being said in the news. Right? More and more, I find there's no place to go to be informed about what is happening without being told either implicitly or explicitly how to think about what is happening. Right? There's, there's, uh, news has become opinion, and in some ways, in a, in a more cynical way, we could say propaganda. And there's a sense that this is more and more the case. Right? It's finding, finding it more and more difficult to find a place where there isn't an ideological underpinning to the, the information that is being delivered. Right? So we could kind of characterize, uh, character, a caricature of this would be uh, Fox on one side and CNN and MSNBC on the other side. Right? If you just take a moment and watch those, you would wonder, like, what is reality? They, they are apparently looking at the same world, the same events, but what they're saying about them and what they're offering us as a way to think about it seem nothing alike. Right? And there's a, there's a way, you know, it, it, it's kind of schizophrenic. It, it doesn't offer a, a middle ground or a spectrum. It is this or that, right? And then um, if you find a moment, which again, far too often, you can find a moment where they'll have a panel of four or 10 people yelling at each other about their ideologies in the form of, of trying to have a debate. But there is no substantive debate about the ideas or the merits and the underpinnings, right, that, that we who want to be informed so that we can be morally responsible can understand these uh, situations in, with nuance. That, that that is almost unavailable in, in you know, kind of popular cultural uh, availability. So TV being one of the mains, but even if we look at um, radio, uh, newspaper, the, the ways we traditionally get our information about the world, we see this happening, this divide. So it is, for me, this contemplation is coming from sitting and looking at that and feeling it. Right? And and, and then looking at the traditions and asking this question of, of what, if anything, do, does the wisdom traditions have to tell us about how to be in this circumstance? Right. And so what came to me, or I was drawn to going back to the, the Bhagavad Gita as a, a source, right? In, in the, the Bhagavad Gita, there is this uh, chapter two, chapter one, chapter two, where um, Arjuna, so it's Arjuna and Krishna, Arjuna representing kind of us, right? The, uh, the, the spiritual aspirant, the, uh, just the person at large, right? Just a, a human being living a human life with aspirations towards the spiritual. And then Krishna, the incarnation of the divine, right? So the self incarnate true nature, given voice. And the situation that you come upon in the, the Bhagavad Gita is the, there's the, the two warring factions, right? The two armies have uh, marshaled on the battlefield, right? So it's kind of posited in a simple way, the, the, the forces of good and evil. Right? But if you, as you dig into it, you find out, if you read the whole uh, Mahabharata, the, the, the uh, the larger story in which the Bhagavad Gita is a very small portion of it. If you, really, it's it's not so clear who like who is the good and who is the evil. Right? It's part of the the brilliance of the story. Is it it has a depth to it 
that mirrors uh, our actual human lived uh, circumstance. So here we come upon Arjuna and Krishna having this conversation on the, the, you know, the eve of the battle and the forces have marshaled and again we're held with the, the, the good over against evil. But it is, as Krishna is looking, he sees on both sides that he has family and friends that, that have been lifelong and, and ideologically they've been divided, but there is he chosen to commence this battle and fight on what is in, in the Bhagavad Gita being generally held as the side of the good. Um, but he can't reconcile that, that this battle is against family and friends and loved ones and, and so collapses and just refuses to, to fight. Right? Falls into kind of a depression but, um, uh, based on kind of an in inability to act, you know, not able to sort out the situation and so uh, collapses in inaction. And I feel like the, 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 the prevalence of that today, like we can find that, we can look around, we could look at the last election and see how many people didn't vote. Right. And we have another election coming up and will we see the same thing? Will we see a large portion of of our electorate choose not to vote because it feels too challenging. Right? You heard that certainly in the last election, presidential election, people said you know, they couldn't make a choice between the two. Right? And those that did, again, had this ideological divide that seems you know, utterly in opposition and without any overlap, or common area. So again, it kind of mirrors this metaphorically, this story. And so, you know, Krishna says to Arjuna, like, you have no choice. Right? You must act. Right? So this is, again, the moral imperative of what the traditions are saying to us. You can't sit on the sidelines. Right? You can't just be a spectator and, and say, so, kick the can down the road, I'll deal with it later, I'll let somebody else. Can't we all get along having wishful thinking, right? Like none of that is allowed. Right? You must take action. And so Arjuna is, is, you know, by the force of truth is pressed into action you know, to do the unthinkable. And so in sitting with with that, reading through the Bhagavad Gita again and being reminded of, of this imperative, it brings me back to, well, what, well, what, how do I know? How do I take action? How, how am I kind of enacting Arjuna in his collapsed state? Right? Kind of being uh, in, a, in a, a lethargy and a depression and a cynicism that that leads to inaction. Where am I doing that? And if I want a path out of that, what does it take for me to be able to move into action? Right? So what are the barriers to that? And what are the supports I need to overcome those barriers? Right? So this is the question that I've been pondering as I, again, look at the circumstance that, that is not abstract to me, as much as I can be in the role of the observer and say, hey, this is happening in our country. Um, it, that I also have to take action. So thinking about this is what um, led me kind of a little bit for at least momentarily outside of the Yoga Sutras. Right? So the, the Yoga Sutras as Dharma um, aren't as explicit as some of the other traditions around what to do. Right? They, aren't, they aren't as directive. And so looking for some of the Dharma where it is a little bit more clearly articulated. Um, I, I looked to the Buddhism and what they have laid out as the uh, Eightfold Path. Right. So many of you might be familiar, I see some nodding. So we have, um, in particular, we're going to talk about three of these that are kind of in the, the moral category uh, within the Eightfold Path. And this is right livelihood, right speech, 
and right action. And so they lay out kind of this, uh, the, the answers to this question, right? The, in a sense, the antidote to this problem. The Buddha recognized this um, even in his time that this was a problem <coughs> for which people needed some support. And so he articulated the Four Noble Truths and then the how to live the Four Noble Truths in the form of the Eightfold Path. And we have these ideas of right action, right speech, and right livelihood. But, you know, at, at the front of it is that word, right. What does that mean? I mean, it, it's, when you think about it, it's not all that helpful. Like, what is right action? And so just moving into it, and, and if we, again, if we don't look for a predetermined list that just tells us this is right action, just always do this, right? Because again, we find that generally when we apply a rule, the, the rule does not take in the, the nuance that life actually is always providing for us, right? And so, what I like about both the Yoga Sutras, the, the Buddha Dharma, it is also true of the, in the Christian uh, scriptures, in the, the Jewish teachings, that they have the same sense in the, in the depth of the tradition. They have this same uh, wisdom that calls us to undertake the process of, of you know, the yoga, the practice of Buddhism, the, the practice of Kabbalah is about clarifying the self to become more and more able to make these decisions, to become more and more response able. That our responses have more wisdom, and again, to, to dip into the yoga tradition, they use the word avidya. Right? So avidya is ignorance or wrong knowledge. Right? When we, we may have a, an idea about something of how it should be, but yoga tells us very often that idea is wrong. Right? And so to inspect that, to always inspect the what we think, and, and as a part of that process of a, of a commitment to always look at what we think and kind of... Uh, 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 reality test it, right? to be willing to kind of falsify our convictions to find out, are they as meritous as we think they are? Mm -hmm. That we also are always working on our self so that we become a clearer and clearer vessel. Mm -hmm. So under avidya comes klesha, right? So kleshas are the impurities. Mm -hmm. So when we're approaching a moral decision, right. a klesha might be that like my, either my desire for pleasure or comfort or my aversion to discomfort. Right. So wanting a situation, like I might have a sense of what's true here, like I know, what, I know what's true here, but if I do it, I might not get what I want. Right. So there's that, be that sense of the, I'll lose, uh, again, perhaps pleasure, perhaps comfort, access, status, perhaps something is at risk. So if I make this choice that I have the intuition is the correct choice, the klesha is, yeah, but, yeah, but if you do that, you'll lose your job, you'll lose friends, you'll uh, you might be seen as, you know, that person, right? So the specter of, of shame or being ostracized. Right? That, that we would allow that to be what ultimately makes the decision as opposed to our, uh, our intuition of the truth. Right? So we could say that that's one example of a klesha, right? That's based in an avidya. Right? That... And this is our work, right, in terms of the spiritual practice. This is our work, to work on ourselves to become more and more clear, more and more response-able, 
such that we are able to make these moral choices and enact them. That's, we could say that that is the demand of the great traditions, to do that. Above anything else, it is to engage in that process. And there is a sense of, you don't, we don't, we are not required, the traditions don't ask us to be perfect in the moment. It is understood that it is a process that happens over a lifetime of becoming more and more transparent to the divine, to become more and more uh, deep in our realization of the truth and our actualization of the truth. That's what's asked of us. And so in any moment, that's all that is required of us, is to do our best with an understanding that later, tomorrow, next week, next year, my best will be better, but it is my best that is required in this moment. So part of what I want us to look at today, so in a moment we're going to break into groups and do some exercises. Those of you who have been here before are familiar with this. Um, Those of you who are not, not to panic. It's actually, I think you'll find it supportive and on the margin of enjoyable, um, a balance between terrifying and enjoyable. Um, But this is what we want to look into is, you know, like where, where are we on this topic of responsibility, right? Like, like how, how, do, how do I think about and relate to responsibility? And is, it a, is it kind of a swear word in my life? How, do I live a life that is on the whole kind of committed to avoiding it? Right? Is, that, is that some internalized idea of the good life? Right? We have this idea of freedom. And in, in many ways, when I talk with people and we get into freedom, it's, it's some, some part of freedom is like not having to be responsible. Right? Because responsibility has a weight to it. We can feel it as a burden. It's difficult. And so we can have an idea that peace, serenity, equanimity, freedom is a freedom from the burden of responsibility. Right? So if, if some of that is in you, we want to find that and look at that and, and see, you know, is that actually true? Right? So looking at responsibility, where did that come from in your life? Right? Are you modeling a parent and you saw a parent as being responsible in a certain way and so that's how you're doing it? Or is it the opposite? You saw a parent being irresponsible and so how you enact responsibility is by not doing what that parent did. And parent, um, sibling, employer, aunt, uncle, neighbor, um, celebrity, where might that be coming from? Where's your idea of responsibility coming from? And similarly, around morals. Like where is your sense of of morality? This idea, when we say use the word right, right action, right speech. There's a lot in that word. And we want to unpack that a little bit to see, like, what is your patterning and structuring around, in any moment, determining the meaning of this word right? And again, does that come from family of origin? Is that uh, parent? Is that family creed? Is that religious creed that is giving that sense of right? Is it something outside of you? You know, some uh, kind of objective code that has been written down that you're trying to follow and you have a sense of following it is good and not following it is bad and therefore if I follow it, I'm good and if I don't, I'm bad. Is that where it exists? Or is it inside of you? Is it... Is it a dynamic that is unfolding in the moment that you're in tune with, such that, that your intuition is providing you with a sense of kind of right and wrong as you navigate the world and there are these moments of decision that have to be made? Mm-hmm. We want to try today to 
you know, at least start the, the, the dialogue with ourself around how are we in these domains? Right? How do I embody and enact this? And as always, it, it is less about whether or not you've got it right. right? Do you, have, have you perfected moral responsibility? If we have that attitude, then we'll go into to this inquiry, or even our practice as a whole, with a sense of defending how we are. Right? And, and I want to invite you to the, the, the consideration that that's not the point here. Right? The point isn't evaluating uh, how, how you're, it isn't judging whether or not you're doing it right. I mean, right, we haven't even started the exercise, and, and each one of you has in you a judge who thinks it knows what's right and will be judging you during the exercise as to whether or not you're, how you're doing. Not so much on the exercise, but on what we're inquiring into. And that can create kind of a closeness and a defendedness. And we really want to, I want and, and encourage you to create an open space for yourself. That this is a process, and Again, our, our prime directive is, is to be with our self on our growing edge. Right? To always be able to locate ourself on our growing edge and be there in a supportive way to encourage the next step. Right? Like where I am is fine, but it's about where I'm going. What is my development? Am I growing wiser, or am I not so much growing wiser as constantly collecting information that allows me to fortify where I am so that I can feel good about myself as I am? And you may find that there is actually quite a bit of activity going on right? that's rather natural. Right? For the, the ego has an inherent sense of deficiency, so it is constantly searching the environment for validation, to say, I'm okay the way I am. And then somebody comes along like me and says, hey, look into how you are. And that can feel threatening. So it'll happen, and the, the point here is to just see, like, to notice, like, oh, there I am doing that. Okay. Yeah. So let's do a couple of exercises. Into looking into this area around responsibility and morals. And so what you're going to do, I'll just give you a little explanation, and then you can go ahead and, and uh, move into your groups. But you're going to get into groups of two. And if there's a, an extra person, I'm happy to be one of the participants to balance out the numbers. But you're going to get in groups of two, take two chairs, uh, face each other at a comfortable distance where you can hear each other talk. You're going to we're going to do what's called a repeating question. So you're going to ask your partner a question. They're going to answer you. You'll say thank you. And you'll ask them the same question again. They'll answer. You say thank you. You ask the question again. So it'll be two minutes. You'll ask the same question for two minutes. And your partner will just give you the answer. So as the person being asked, your job is to be present with yourself and to just give voice to what's arising in response to the question, whether it makes sense or not. Making sense isn't the goal. Answering the question correctly is not the goal. Right? The goal is to take this opportunity, your partner is holding space for you, and the question is an, is an invocation. Right? It, is, it is stimulating a response in you, and your job is to just be present for that response and to be with it. Right? Be willing to be surprised by what comes up. Put a few words to it, and then the next question comes. Right? So this is the practice of self-inquiry, a way of kind of opening yourself up to get a sense of your patterned self and to just meet that self with curiosity and compassion. Right? It's just you. No matter what it is, it's you. 
meet yourself with compassion, curiosity. So we'll do that, and then I'll keep time, and I'll tell you to switch, then the other person will ask the question, the other person will answer the question, and then we're going to do two questions, so we'll repeat that. I'll give you the questions once you get set up. If you have something to write, write on, you want to write the question down, great. If you have a device and you want to type the question in, great. And if you don't, not to worry, I'll give you the question again as needed. Okay? So go ahead and just take a moment and find groups of two and arrange your chairs in a way